So I grew up in church, like in church, like Sunday was like not an option. My connection with God was pretty much to, to make my father happy. It was like this mandatory thing that we had to pray about, we had to think about, we had to talk about. I knew I didn't have it all together. I knew that my family didn't have it all together, but we sure did 
walk it out as if we did. You did wrong and you know you did it. You know you did it. Say, I know I did it. I know I did it. You know what I mean? It was like that kind of experience. I go to church. I hang out with my church friends. I do all this. And then I go over here every once in a while to be who I really am. By 18, I was just done. I started stand-up comedy in 96. Every night was just, would be do the show, go get hammered. I would go out three times a week, and I probably put I probably put a medium-sized house up my nose. If I was a rapper, I thought that's what I would be doing for the rest of my life. Uh, this is one thing that I do that people enjoy. I need to figure out a way to monetize this. So yeah, it was it was all about me. Went to college and just did anything and everything I could because I had freedom for the first time. I would sometimes pray to <laughs> pray to the God that I I claimed to not believe existed. I just did not want to admit that my way wasn't going to work. So I was going to rap battles, I was winning battles, we were doing shows at different places. It, it seems like I, I had a room full of people that were, that were cheering me on, but I was alone. I was actually the most depressed and the most alone that I had ever been because I'd left all of my family, everything that I knew, all of my friends behind. Things were caving in. Like I, so the walls were, were moving in on me. I remember my, my sister approaching me. She didn't have a clear objective. She just wanted to let me know that she was there for me. I was just, I just opened up to her and I said, no, things are not good right now. Things are really bad right now. So I end up in, I end up in jail. I'm thinking it's gonna be a short term thing overnight. Uh, it ends up being much more than that and I'm there for five days. I didn't know what else to do other than ask for help from Jesus because I knew in that moment more than ever before that I needed him like to show up. After I got my hair cut, um, we, we went to go get breakfast and he said, hey, Sean, when are you gonna look, give your life to Jesus, man? Just God was just in the back of my head. And I remember hearing, I, saw, I heard something on the radio and it was, it was about kids being hurt or something like that and out loud to the God that I claimed that I didn't believe existed. I said, how could you let that happen? The response I felt was like, well, it's free will. You have your own free will. You can do whatever you want. I forgive you, I love you. I just felt an embrace and I, and I, I haven't been the same since. So coming out of that, a friend that I don't even know well actually invited me to a church and I just knew immediately I was to like be plugged in there and that was gonna be my new church. It was years and years of my sister's prayer that led me to that, to that encounter with God. But once it did happen, I mean, I, who wouldn't wanna to go to church every Sunday? It was the very first time in LA that I had like real community, real friends. Here's the thought and fear do not get caught. If you're feeling like you should really invite somebody and don't want to bring them to the party without the correct information. No interrogation, just say, please come. Don't be dumb, no matter where you're from. But this is what I know, that Jesus' love came for you and you can come for them and give a helping hand to woman and man. And then they'll understand when they feel the joy. And then they will see that their life is changed because Jesus came in and it's nothing strange. <laughs> I love the line, please come, don't be dumb. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. That, so you invite somebody, say, would you please come, don't be dumb. Let's see how that effective that is. All right. All right. My name's Tom, and you are? Hi, I'm Vicki Burton. And we are so glad that you guys are here this morning. Let's give a round of applause to Oak Ridge Online, all the people are joining us there. Hey, you know, on the, uh, if you guys remember the Christmas services, how many of you guys were here for the first service on Sunday morning? Or was it? Yeah, it was Sunday morning. How many of you guys were here, and it was just packed? You guys remember that? I mean, just crazy packed, right? I mean, just nuts packed. And there is hardly no room at all. And I'm hoping that doesn't happen this year. And here's what we have on Good Friday. We have services at 6 and 745. I believe the 6 o'clock one. How many of you plan going to the 6 o'clock one? Raise your hand. How many of you plan on going to the 745 one? Raise your hand. All right, I think the 745 one is going to be the less attended one. That's what we thought. So for some of you, you could go to the 745. That would be great. Last year, we had standing room only for the 
for the uh, uh, Good Friday service, but we only had one service, so two this year. And then on, uh, on Easter, we have a service this Saturday at 5 o'clock. So you guys could really do us a big favor by opening it up Sunday morning at the 8.45 and 10.45 by coming Saturday at 5. And then guess what? You can sleep in all Sunday, all right? <laughs> Nobody can say anything about it. So that's my encouragement to you. For those of you that are seasoned Christians that understand you have a little flexibility in your schedule, then uh, if you could respond accordingly, knowing that uh, we'd love to have you uh, make a, a few more room for our guests this week, if you could pick that service. Deal? Vicki, what do you got for us? Hey, this is week four of our March prayer emphasis. Um, I want to ask how many of you picked up prayer cards last week? Look at that. Yeah. And how many of you planted them in different places? I heard from a, um, a little birdie told me that somebody made a trip to the state capitol and planted some there. Yep. And I think that's so awesome because we know that these are seeds that we're planting and God's going to bear good fruit from them. That birdie wasn't me. It was my daughter, I yeah. believe, and her family. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. And so today, the ones that, um, that I'm bringing to your attention are some of the more difficult parts of prayer. Um, because we know that you know God's not like this vending machine that we put our prayer in the slot and we get the candy-coated answer out the bottom. Sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes we have to wait a long time. But he's moving and he's working. So today's are um, handling disappointment, unanswered prayer, and grief and sorrow. So for those of you who are maybe new to your faith and you're praying and you're not seeing answers, it can be very discouraging because you don't have all those years of seeing the small victories. You don't have all those years to look back to and go, I remember when he did this, and I remember when he did this. But it will happen. He is healing people. He is restoring people. He's redeeming those things that you messed up in your life, and he's restoring broken relationships. But you just haven't seen it yet because you're kind of new. For those of us who have been doing it a long time, we can look back and we can remember, and this is what living in Christ is supposed to be like, you know, that we can go back to those times and those give us hope. But we still get disappointed. We're not, we're not bulletproof. That's right. <laughs> and, um, and we're not immune to disappointment and discouragement. And so we need to pray about that. And these cards, I promise you, will pr help you pray through those times until you get to the other side, and then you can look back. Yep. So there's still more out front, They're right? still out there, and then after this week, uh, you'll always be able to find them in the reflection room, and there's also a um, display that's on the wall as you enter uh, the bookstore. So they're here year-round, but today, please... Take a bunch. Share yeah. them with your neighbors and coworkers. Yeah, put them some Easter baskets. Mm -hmm. Vicki, why don't you say a prayer for us? I, you okay, I'd be happy to. Father God, thank you for bringing us here today, and thank you for um, being here before we ever walked in the door, that you meet us here. Father, thank you for this opportunity to, to present more resources on praying and helping people become more consistent and confident because we know that it just brings power into our life. But Father, I pray that our worship this morning will come before our wish lists. That we will worship you with all of our hearts. I pray, Father God, that we will seek your face before we seek your hand. But I'm so grateful that when we get it backwards, you still love us and you still call us your own and you forgive us, and you do answer prayers. And so we give this time to you, Father God. I hope that, I pray that you would help us focus on the real meaning of coming here, and that's to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stand up, say to somebody around you, and let's go to God.
Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder.
Take a seat just real fast. We've got one more song we're going to sing. But I want to give you a time of prayer. Um, the song we're going to sing says, Jesus, you silence fear. We live with one eye on earth and we live with one eye on heaven. And we, if you are here last week, we talked in the book of John and we talked about a fifth superpower that Christians have. It's called the faith factor. And it simply is just about no matter what you're going through, Jesus is in the storm with you. And while you're not bigger than the storm, he is. And your faith is in him to either deliver you from the storm, to hold you in the storm, or to see you through it. That's where he's at. And for some of you, you know you're in a storm right now. You know you have somebody that you really love and you care about, that they're in the storm. And I think this is a perfect time in the service for you to go to God who's with us. For you to go to God confidently because of what Jesus has done if you've trusted in the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. He's made God accessible to you. And why don't you go to God say, God, could you help? Maybe the God factor comes in where God just does something that only God can do. But either way, I, I ask for you to pray in the middle of the storm that your faith takes over for fear and that you can lay fear down and you can pick up your faith and say, I hold on to you, Jesus. So why don't you go to God just in a moment of prayer, maybe for you or for somebody you know, and uh, just lift it up to the Lord. Jesus, we come to you and we praise you. God, we thank you for hearing our prayers through your son. God, sometimes fear is so loud 
it's the only thing that we hear. Sometimes fear is so bright. It's the only thing that we see. Dear God, I pray that you silence fear, that you replace that with faith. Faith in Jesus who walks with us through the storm. Father, I thank you that Jesus is bigger than the storm. I thank you for the stories of people who have gone through them hand in hand with with your son. God, I pray for the person today that just needs to feel the palm of Jesus and needs to release the fear that's in their hand to him. God, today is the day that we thank you for that time period that you can give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. A hope that goes beyond our circumstances that's not weak, but it's strong. God, I thank you for these moments of prayer where we can come in like a lamb and come out like a lion, knowing that the lion of the tribe of Judah is working in our life. Father, we're gonna sing a song. We've sang it to you before here. But for many of us, that are here today. Maybe it's the first time we can sing it as an anthem of our faith. That fear is not going to win the day. God, hear our words, and as we sing them to you, touch our hearts with your peace, your hope. God, we love you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we're here. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together and sing. Yeah.
you guys take a seat and uh, direct your attention to the screen, please. Well, if you're counting, we're in week 16 of John, and by my best estimates, we have about 75 weeks to go in John, so you, you, hopefully you're enjoying the book. If not, then find another church for another year and a half, because we're going to be in it for a while. Uh, today's teaching is one of the most controversial teachings in the church today, and uh, I'm going to try and simplify it as best I can, and I think you uh, can maybe come to the same conclusion that we have, I believe, from it. It's today's teaching is the first of the seven I am statements that Jesus makes during the book of John. He'll make six more that we'll go through. The book of John is so rich. Imagine that you're at a gold mine, and all of a sudden you find uh, a little piece of gold, and you go, well, this is this book. John is like when you go to a gold mine, and you find everything inside of it is full of gold. And you, anywhere you touch, it's just gold. That's the richness of of the book of John. That's the gift that God has given us through this book. That's the gift that Jesus' best friend while I was on the earth gave us. It is so rich, so many applications for life change for every age and stage of life. No matter whether you're young, 13, 14, 15, or whether you're 85, no matter whether you're in great health or poor health, no matter if if you're uh, lonely or your relationships are full, this book has so much depth and teaching to it. Um, It's first of the the seven I am statements we're going to go over today a little bit. And then there's a part in the, that I'll end with that talks about grumbling and people leaving Jesus. This is the first time where a large group of people decided to leave Jesus, and uh, you're going to hear why. All right. There's a thing called figurative literal and plain literal, meaning I believe the Bible is literal. I take it literally for what it says. But there are some parts of the Bible I have to figure out whether it's figurative little or plain, straightforward little. I'll give you some examples. If I told you today, I'm so hungry, I could eat a house. That's figurative little. I'm so hungry, I could eat a house. What's the plain literal to that? I'm very hungry. You say, you're so hungry, you could eat a house. I don't believe you're going to eat a house. Why would that help you? Right? But if I say, I'm so hungry, I could eat a house, but I'm very hungry. How about this one? I have a million things to do. What are you really saying? I'm busy, man. I got so much stuff to do, right? You don't have a million things to do. What million things? If you made a list, how long would it take you to write a list of a million things? It would take your lifetime, right, to write that. You don't. So the figurative literal, it's right. You said, I have a million things to do. I get it. You're going to be busy. Here's another one for you. Um, Your purse weighs a ton. (laughs) How many of you men have ever, my my wife says, just get my car keys out of my purse. It's like a pouch that's this big, but it's like this when you dig into it. Can't find anything. I get frustrated. I said, no, I'm not going to go through that ever again. Here's your purse. You find it. So if you say your purse weighs a ton, do you believe it weighs 2,000 pounds or it's just what? Heavy. All right. You know that. How about this one? I could sleep forever. No, then you're probably dead. That probably, you know, I guess, you know. But you say, I could sleep forever. You say, I'm very tired, right? So the figurative literal, it's literal. I said, look, I could sleep forever. I don't, have to, I don't have to break it down anymore. I could sleep forever. You get it. It's true. It's literal. I'm very tired, right? Here's another one. This outfit cost me an arm and a leg. <laughs> it didn't cost you an arm and a leg. You're not like hopping around anymore. I mean, it's just not that way, right? It's very expensive. That's what you're saying. This is very expensive. How about this last one? I'll give you the last one. It's raining cats and... It's not raining cats and dogs. There it hit, right? He said it's raining hard. It's raining really hard. So you understand when you read something in the Bible, you got to say, is this figurative literal? I mean, it's literal, but is it figurative of speech? Is it a figure of speech that you use, or is it just plain literal? They said, look, it's just raining hard. That's plain literal. Raining cats and dogs, that's figurative literal. But both of them are literal. Correct? With me on that? In uh, Matthew 18, 21 through 22, I think they have that. Put that up there if you can put that up on the screen. We're going to read this together. You're going to see where Jesus used figurative literal and oftentimes uses plain literal, but he will use figurative. So let's read this together. Ready? Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? 
Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Do you think he sinned after 78? (laughs) What he sinned is you need to forgive him how often? All the time. As I've forgiven you now, it may be a process. It may look different for you, but he's not telling you it's 77 times. Now, I think, uh, I'm not going to go into the theology of it, but I believe Peter was asking specifically seven times. And uh, Jesus said, no, so let's read another one. Matthew 5, uh, 29. Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. He's talking about sin. Let's say it's lust. Would you still lust if your eyes were closed? When you sleep at night and you have a dream, your eyes are closed. Correct? So he's not telling you to gouge your eye out. What he's telling you is it'd be better just sin is bad. Stay away from it. Run away from it. Do all you can possibly do to stay away from it. That's what he's simply saying here. Let's read another one. Matthew 23, 27. Matthew 23, 27. Ready? Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. He's not telling that they're whitewashed tombs. He's not saying they look like a little square that's white. That's not what he's saying. He said the outside, you look good on the outside, but the inside's really dirty. It's a figure of speech that he gives. And, this is, and the last one I'll give you is Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. These are good. Again, the words of Jesus. Ready? You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. He says, you're the light of the world. Does that mean you should walk around with a candle, a flashlight? No, what he's saying is, is simply that uh, the deal is, is that you illuminate truth. You're the light of the world. You tell about the truth of Jesus. You're the light. That's why you come and be a light. If you don't talk about Jesus, who's going to talk about him? People that are in the dark, that don't know, you're the light of the world. So all I've tried to show you is that Jesus, and there's more I could give you, Jesus uses figurative literal, and he also uses plain literal uh, as well. You're going to have to understand that to understand this teaching, which is why this teaching is so conf- is, is so, uh, so much conflict about this teaching, and it shouldn't be that way. It's so controversial, but it shouldn't be that way. Quick review. Uh, last week, we talked about that uh, 5,000 uh, men came to hear Jesus speak on a mountainside near a uh, sea, and that didn't include uh, women and children, so we think there are about 20,000 people that went there. He fed them all with five barley loaves and two fish, and they just kept eating and eating and eating. And then that night, he told the disciples uh, to leave by boat. The boat ran into a storm. Yes, right? And then how did Jesus get there? Walked on water. See, you guys are, here's the other thing I want to tell you. Don't blow off how much you guys are learning. Don't blow off how much your growth in Christ has come because the word of God does that. It somehow just changes you. And um, so Jesus walked on water and he calmed the storm. And then we learned last week about faith over fear. Jesus is in the storm. Sometimes he allows you to go in the storm. Sometimes he uh, brings you through the storm, but he's with you in the storm. That's where we're at. So he had walked on the other side and now we pick up John 6. I'm going to read 22 through 25, but here's where we're going. Today I'm reading uh, verses 22, I think, through 70. So we're going through a whole lot of scripture today. And so I'm going to move rather quickly as I can. And, uh, but where we go is worth waiting. It's worth listening to. John 6, 22 through 25. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boat and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Rabbi is just a Jewish word which just means teacher. So they acknowledged that he was somebody special. They didn't acknowledge who we know Jesus to be, but they called him rabbi. So they gave him at least a term of respect. Rabbi, when did you get here? It's a great question. When did you get here? That's a great great question. They're asking, how did you get here? What was going on? Here's the question I want to ask you. Why were they following Jesus? 
Why would they get in a boat, go across the Sea of Galilee, anywhere between 6 and 11 miles, put out all the way? Why would, they, why would they possibly do that, to continue to follow Jesus? What was it at this point of Jesus' ministry? What was it that, that they cared about Jesus about? This is the point where some people, some of you maybe, are at or have been. And here's uh, my opinion of, of why I believe that they follow Jesus. He fed them yesterday. Their bellies were full. Jesus says that they had enough that they collected the leftovers, 12 baskets left over for each of the apostles to pick up. Their bellies were full. It wasn't an easy time to find food back there for a lot of people. So they had bellies full. They said, let's go find Jesus. They said, when did you get here? Maybe implying, did you get here early enough where you could get food for us all? I don't know if that was a statement. I'm reading into it, but that's my guess. Why would they care otherwise? In other words, they were bandwagon followers. They were bandwagon. They were jumping on the bandwagon because of what Jesus could do for them. That's clearly, in my world, their motive. John 6, 26 through 27. Jesus answered. He says, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me. Now listen. Not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. I had done signs before. I turned water into wine. I'd had uh, an invalid stand up after 38 years. There's probably other uh, miracles that John didn't record that he also did. He says, but you're here today. He calls them out because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. So he makes a, a plat. He says, I know why you're here. I know exactly why you're here. Then he goes on, verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life in which the Son of Man will give you. Now, they called him who? Rabbi. For those of you that are Christians, you don't call him Rabbi. You call him Savior. You call him Lord. Do not work for the food that spoils, for that food, for that, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. We get this picture where he says, look, I don't want you to work for food that spoils. That's what they want. All they wanted was what Jesus could give them for that day. And he said it was food here. He said, that's not what I'm talking about. He says, but there's a food, now get this and look at me, hang, hang with me, that, that leads to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now, we know he's talking about himself. All right? He was talking about himself, but I'm not sure they saw that. In fact, I believe most of them did not. For on him, God the Father has placed a seal of approval. You ever seen a good housekeeping seal of approval on, on a vacuum cleaner or something like that? Where you know, okay, this is a vacuum cleaner worth buying. It's got a seal of approval, of approval on it. Jesus is telling them, he's identifying who he is, the God the Father, the creator of everything, the Lord you worship, Yahweh, he has put his seal of approval on the Son of Man, who's a reference to Jesus. He's put a seal of approval. He's saying that I am he. All right. So Jesus is pointing to his identity and his purpose. Now, here's a pause right now. They believed that Jesus' identity was a rabbi. They believed he was there uh, to provide food for them. That's why I believe they followed him, and that's why Jesus called him out. So here's something that you got to get. The purpose of Jesus is Savior, not Santa. That's the purpose of Jesus. It's Savior, not Santa Claus. Now, I believe God can do anything. I do believe that. But his purpose is not to be your Santa. It's to be your Savior. The purpose of Jesus is Lord, not leprechaun. It's, it's Lord, not leprechaun. And yet some people come to Jesus. Now look at me. It may not be you or maybe it is you. But you've gone to Jesus and you've been disappointed because he did not do, you put in the blank. He did not do this for me. He did not bring this person. He did not bring this person back. He did not fix this problem. Because you were looking for a Jesus that was like this Jesus that these people were looking for. A Santa, a leprechaun. Instead of a Savior and a Lord. A Savior from your sin, from the wrath of God, and Lord over your life. One to follow, one to surrender to. John 6, 28 through 29. Then they asked him, well, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Remember in verse 27, he said, do not work for food that spoils. So then they said, well, what work should we do to get food that doesn't spoil? That's what they say. He said, don't work for food that spoils. So they're missing the whole point. And he says, 
what must we do to do the work that God requires? Now, that's a good question. You know how many people come up to me, and I said, look, do you know about Jesus? Nah, I'm a pretty good person. My aunt was a good person. My grandma was a good person. Really? Yeah, I think they're okay with God. And what works did they do to make themselves okay with God? Well, she never cussed. I never heard her say a cuss word in my life. So if you don't cuss, you go to heaven. She never killed anybody. I don't know anybody that's killed anybody, by the way. All right, so that's not, not much of a big deal. Go on and on. Same question. What work, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Now, why didn't Jesus answer? Well, here's the list. You had them before. There's the Ten Commandments. You had them. All right, I'm going to do, do I go over them again? That should not kill. That should not murder. Honor the mother, father. Uh, keep, keep the Sabbath holy. Have no other idols before God. Right? What, instead, here's what Jesus answered. The work of God is this. You, you read it. Read it. So you want this, you want to have this food that leads to eternal life? Not physical food. Spiritual food, which is greater, much greater. The, your work is to believe in Jesus. That's it, to have faith and trust in Jesus. It's not a list of behaviors. I wrote this down early this morning. The work God gives us to do is to believe in the works God gave Jesus to do. That's your work, to believe in Jesus. And that's your work right now, whether you're 14 or 85. That's your work today, whether you've slept in 25 different beds with 25 different people whether you stole everything that you could put your hands on around people, whether you've hurt everybody with your words, whether you've drank yourself into a stupor every night for five years, your work is to believe in the works that Jesus did for you. John's teaching is so amazing. Can you imagine John, who grew up believing it's all about laws? It's all about Jesus. John 6, 30 through 34, as we continue. Oh, by the way, I'm going to go jump back. Jump back to that, put that uh, little PowerPoint back up on the screen again. The work God gives us to do is to believe in the works that God gave Jesus to do. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, what, believes in him shall not perish. See how it ties in? See, John said that earlier in John chapter 3. He's just reiterating here in John chapter 6, what Jesus is saying, trying to get these group of people to understand. You cannot be good enough. I am the only one that can. I'm your only hope. Only hope. John 6, 30 through 34. So they asked him, well, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna, which we'll talk about in a second, in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're quoting Exodus, Exodus 16, 4 where it says that uh, when the Israelites left Egypt, manna of bread from heaven came down every morning in the form of dew, then hardened, and they had this uh, bread cake to eat. But they could only gather enough for that day. They could only eat enough for that day. If they gathered more and tried to store, store it, it turned moldy. God wanted them to have faith every single day that he would provide for them. That's what this was about. So they asked, what sign then will you give us that we see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness that was written. He gave them bread. Again, back to food. He's trying to tell them about belief, and now they're going right back to food again, aren't they? Well, he gave this man. Are you going to give us something better? That's, and, and here's Jesus. I think he's got to be thinking, oh, I'm going to give you some, something so much better than this man. But I think they couldn't get past, I just want my physical needs met. Can you get past your physical needs not being met by Jesus? Because some of you are going to pray for a person that has cancer, and they're going to die. Some of you are going to get sick, and you're going to lose a foot because you ate too much sugar. There's going to be some things that Jesus, I'm not saying he can't, and I'm not saying he won't, but I'm saying there's times where he doesn't. Are you going to lose your faith? Because is it a faith in a Santa and a leprechaun? Is it that weak, that small? Jesus is bigger than that. It's living with one eye on earth and living with one eye on heaven. And understand that Jesus came to do something for us that we could not do for ourselves when we stand before God. And that is to redeem us, to bring him back to him. This is the picture that Jesus has given early on in the ministry. 
Jesus said to them, verse 32, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Jesus he said, I'm the bread. I'm the bread of life. Remember when they said, send us a sign? I think they already had enough evidence. I mean, I think they heard about the water and the wine thing. I think they heard about the invalid. I know they uh, realized that they were there and got fed with uh, some, a little bit of bread and a couple of fish. So I know they saw that. They still needed another sign. Some of you have enough evidence. There's been enough signs in your life. There's been enough things that you've seen Jesus do that you can make a decision. You don't need one more. You don't need something else. You just need to make the decision. You need to pull down the wall, wall of pride and the wall of arrogance, and you need to bend your knee to the one who loves you most. That's a simple, straightforward gospel. When we see baptism, that's exactly what it is. When somebody comes out, in the last baptism service we, we, we had, I had a person that I love and admire, and when he got done being baptized, he whispered in my ear, and the lion roared. Oh, I almost want to cry when I say it. That has fired me up. The lion roared when he saved you. The lion roared when he came down off that cross, victorious over my sin and your sin and death itself. No more pain, no more sorrow. That's the way it'll be. And in this earth, once we trust and accept Christ, he comes and he abides with us here. Now, his power, his superpowers, gratitude, humility, praise, worship, the God factor, the faith factor, and five more we're going to learn in John. It's an abundant life that he wants you to have here. But in this life, he says, you will have trouble, but take heart. Someday I'm going to wipe all that away, and it will be as it's supposed to be. And all God's people said, give us this bread. No, they didn't want the bread. They just wanted Santa Jesus. And I mean, I understand it. But that's not what Jesus came. Well, now we're going to turn a corner and go into figurative little. It's the first I am statement. The most controversial, one of the most controversial teachings in religion today. And I tell you religion because different denominations have different takes on this. And many of you grew up in a denomination that I believe has a take that's opposite of what I think scripture teaches. John 6, 35 through 40. So pause. They're saying, hey, we want this bread of life. These guys are all saying, this is what we want. Now, they think it's going to be some kind of manna that falls down from heaven that never uh, goes bad, that they can have every single day so they don't have to find food anymore. They don't have to... That's what they're thinking, correct? All right. You have the advantage now of understanding the cross. And by the way, today's message was going to be my Easter message. But for some reason, I don't know, God, I guess, wanted it today. John 6, 35 through 40. Then Jesus declared to them, he says, I am the bread of life. First I am statement. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and you still you do not believe. Now talk. The manna that came from heaven was physical food, and it rotted. The bread of life that Jesus is talking about is spiritual food, and it never rots. It's forever. Do you want physical food where you'll be hungry tomorrow? Or do you want spiritual food that leads you with God forever? That's what he's talking about. So much better, so much bigger. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me, and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will call, come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of God of the one who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. I love this. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. He says, that's my will. 
See, you think you need food, but what you don't understand is you need a Savior is what he's telling them. More than your physical needs, you need a spiritual need. And that's it for all of us. Well, the question people ask then sometimes about this statement is, well, can you lose your faith? Can I lose my faith? It's really the wrong question. The right question is this. Can Jesus lose one of his? No. It's not, you say, can I lose my faith? That's just not the right question. The question is, can Jesus lose one of his? If you became his, if you believed in him, if you've trusted in him, can Jesus lose one? No. He says, that's the will of the Father. He says, I cannot lose one. John 6, 41 through 42. This is where grumbling comes in. At this, the Jews began to, be, to, to, began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? What they're saying is, this is just a dude. We know his mom and dad. How can he say, I came down from heaven? They have even discounted the bread of life. They said, how can he say he came down from heaven? They said, they just think he's a guy. A common thing to try and rip Jesus by saying he's not the son of God. That's how we got Islam, Muslims, that he's not God's son. That's how we have uh, Buddhists. They say he's not the son of God. He is the son of God. That's what Christianity teaches. That's what we believe. And if you're not there, then I would just say, just look at it. Go along, John, with us. Read any other book you want, but go along with this. All right. So now here's the controversial teaching. John 6, 43 through 50, uh, 59, 57, I think is what it is. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to, the, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at, at the last day. It is written in the prophets that they will all be taught by God. He's now quoting Isaiah. They quoted Exodus. He's now quoting Isaiah. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one who has seen the Father except the one who is from God, only he has seen the Father. Talking about himself. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. Then he says it very clearly. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. Anyone, for all people. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Is this figurative literal, or is this plain literal? Hold on. That's the question I'm going with this. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were taking something that he says, my body is going to be, and and my body and my blood are going to be shed and broken for you. That's figuratively literal. That is what's going to happen. But they take it and says, well, I have to eat his actual body and flesh. Then the Jews began to argue among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus, verse 53. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Figurative, literal. That's what he is. Spiritual food. Not physical food. It's spiritual food. He's not telling you to eat his flesh, and drink his blood. That's a spiritual statement. It's a figuratively literal. He's giving you another picture. He's not offering his thumb or his finger for them to eat. He's not uh, letting out a vein for them to drink. Yet the people at that time period thought that's what he was saying. And he wasn't. Verse 57, just as the living father sent me, And I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me, the one who trusts in me, the one who accepts me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but for whoever feeds on the bread of life will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Can you see it? On the Last Supper, when they got together, and he's telling them, take, eat, and drink. He's not giving them any part of his body. He's giving them bread, unleavened bread. He's giving them wine or fruit of the vine. He's giving them to do as a remembrance of who he is. 
Communion is a remembrance of what Jesus has done for us spiritually. What he's done for us, taking our wrath, the punishment we deserved. What he's done for us by opening the doors back to heaven to be redeemed back to God. Giving us eternal life by what he's done. John 6, 60 through 70, as we get ready to go to wrap this up. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is his followers, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Now remember, you have the benefit of looking back. You've had the cross. You understand the bread of life. You understand his body shed and broken for you. They didn't. If somebody said, I'm as hungry as a horse, I could eat a horse. I'm so hungry I can eat a horse. What if you didn't know what a horse was? You might have thought that was possible, wouldn't you? Have? Well, a horse, what's this, like a cheeseburger? Was it like a piece of fish? I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. But you know, here he's saying, I give you my body. I give you my shed blood to cover all sin. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? What if you see me go back up to God? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. He's telling you, obviously, it's one eye on earth and one eye on heaven with 2020 focus on Jesus. But the eternal is a lot longer than the temporary. I know as you get older, you realize life is short. Amen? But a season can feel long. And a period can feel long. And a day can feel long. And a moment can feel long. But brother and sister, look. Have eternal eyes. You see the one who holds eternity in his hands that offers it to us. Offers it to us and our family and our friends and all who we come into contact with. The words I have spoken to you, this is Jesus, they are full of the spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Did he still love those people? Crazy, isn't it? He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Those 20,000 people, a lot of them left. The teaching was too hard, too difficult. They didn't fully understand it, and even if they did, they didn't want to accept it. That's what happens today. He has a hard teaching on truth in Scripture. Hard teaching on sexuality. Hard teaching on forgiveness. A hard teaching on how to love. And people don't like it, so they walk away because their highest authority, since they're a selfie, is themselves. And I ask you not to do that. I ask you not to do that. From this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Here's the key. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the 12, yet one of you is the devil? He knew at that time period who was going to betray him. He knew. Here's the point. God loves you. No matter where you've been, no matter how you've been, you need to him. But you need to believe. You need to trust in him. And when we take communion together, which we're going to do, and you can get it ready, this is remembrance of of the broken body of Jesus. This is a remembrance of the shed blood of Jesus. I do not believe that this is the actual body and blood of Jesus. If you grew up with that teaching, I would just tell you to look at this. And not that it makes a difference to me one way or the other. But I'm giving you where this scripture comes from. We do this in remembrance. Jesus said it. In one of his last times together with the apostles, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Has it worked? Has this symbol of remembrance worked? Yes, there's th- two and a half billion people later, 2,000 years later, we still do this as we gather together in churches all over the world. Do this in remembrance of what God has done. Do this because we believe what God has done through Jesus. It is still a holy thing to do. 
It is a mysterious thing to do. And is it a good thing to do? If you're here today and you do not believe, then do not take part of this. This is not for you yet. But if, this is, if you know that Jesus is who he said he is, if you know that he paid a debt that you owed to God, if you know that his greatness, his mighty, his power, his worth, his life covers your sin, and that someday you'll stand before God white as a lamb, then now take the bread. That represents his broken body. Take, eat, and remember that for 33 years, he fought for you. He fought for me. He was obedient to God. He trusted God in everything he did. Take the bread and eat. Then take the cup. That represents the fruit of the vine. The shed blood of Christ that covers our sin. Take and drink. Father, we praise you that the work that we do is to believe in your son whom you sent. God, we thank you for that. Father, I pray for the person today that's in this room that is just grumbling about you. I pray that they bend the knee and instead of grumble, Replace that with gratitude. I pray for the person that's grumbling that come to know who you are more through this amazing book that we call John. God, I pray for the person today that has read and ran into some hard teachings from you. God, I've been one of those where I just scratch my head and I don't understand what you're saying and I don't understand why you're doing it or I don't understand why you're allowing it but I still believe. I believe that what you've done for us is out of love, that you loved us so much that you sent your son, Jesus, and I believe in what he did. And God, I pray for the world for next week when all eyes on this planet, for the most part, have an opportunity to remember fully the death and the resurrection of Jesus. God, we praise you for that. Father, we come to you and we ask you to touch our hearts again. We thank you that this doesn't have to be a controversial teaching. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God, hear our words as we sing. We thank you for this anchor to our life. Bless those that come today to know your son more. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Let's stand and sing.
say something that's just so beautiful and so clear. Aren't you glad that the work the Father gave us is to believe in His Son? Now listen, before you say anything, some of you are doing that work. You're trying to figure out who God is. You're trying to figure out who Jesus is. Keep doing that work. That is the work that God the Father gave you to do. Our church's responsibility, our church's role is to point people towards Jesus so they can believe and do the work that God wants, and they can walk with Jesus, and they can know Jesus. That's why we read scripture, that's why we sing songs, that's why we gather together in groups, that's why we serve together, that's why we teach the little kids. And by the way, I sold out of my book in my contest to (laughs) Herc. No, I mean the uh, book thing that we have, right? And he's got 10 books left, but I thought for Easter, and it's not fair of me, but I bought this book in and it's $20 and I marked it down to 10 bucks so you can put in some Easter baskets. I brought in a hundred of these. I would love nothing more for Easter than to be able to sell, I outsold Herc 10 to one. I'd love to be able to say that. (laughs) So these are out there if you need a a gift for you. We have the edge tonight. Guess what we're gonna be talking about to the edge? Jesus, how to believe in him, how to trust in him, how he's good, how he loves you how there's nothing that you've ever done in your life that has ruined his love for you. He will offer himself to you until you take your last breath. And you know what? Many and many of them know and they believe and they're a light in a dark world. They're pointing other people to Jesus. You can too as well. We have this little packet if you're new today, we'd love to give you. It's called, we're glad you're here. You can get it at the information desk. Uh, There's a coupon in there. If you take it right around the corner to the connect room, it's about five steps. They'll uh, answer any questions you have about our church, and they'll give you a free T-shirt for you and everybody that's with you today. So if you'd love to get one of those, we'd love to help you. Look, I pray that Easter's richer this week for you. I pray that you know about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I pray that you know that he is the bread of life, much greater than the manna that God gave the Israelites. He gave us spiritual food that lasts forever. Father, we praise you. I pray your blessings upon every person here. I pray that you bless their generations behind them because of their faith in you. God, we thank you for this place. We thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Have a good week. Thanks for coming. Super.
city now there is no record you assume the best of me and this is why I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak so I will sing this is why I thank the Lord for 
for everything and this is why I thank the Lord all of my affection everything I have to give the sum of my attention is measured in the praise I lift so this is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak so I will sing this is how I thank All of a sudden, I'm unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us, oh, oh, how he loves us. How he loves us all. And he is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden. I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me Oh, how he loves, how he loves us Oh, how he loves us Prize, drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes and this grace is an ocean we're all sinking and heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves
So you catch me when I fall, right? And you hear me when I call crying And you fix me when I'm broke, right? And that's all I need to know So the storm is gonna break, right? And the sun is gonna start shining And everything is gonna go right and That's all I need to know What if you know something I don't? What if you will something I won't? If you don't give me what I want, but you give me what I need, is that enough to believe, believe, believe? I still believe, 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 believe in your love. So nothing's ever going wrong, right? And every day I'm gonna be smiling. Turn my water into good wine. And let the good times roll But what if you know something I don't What if you will something I won't If you don't give me what I want But you give me what I need Is that enough to Believe, 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 believe in your love Will I still What you can do for me Do I love you? Do I love you? Do I love you? What you can do for me Sometimes I don't know But all I want